Good afternoon and welcome to the Mark Logic community event for September. Um, welcome from the CSM team. Um, we've got a really packed agenda today, so uh, let me just go through uh, what, we, what we're going to cover. Um, we have been doing these for a, a while now, and we've built up a bit of a library of content that you can find on our YouTube channel. Um, be some links in a minute where we've had people from the APA, we've had industry experts such as Helen Nepal, our partners such as David and Clever Llamas, um, and customers like um, ESI Labs um, and the APA. Uh, all of these are available on demand on our YouTube channel. Um, you can scan the quick QR code and we'll make sure to send you links to all of these. Uh, after the event as well. But we need your input to make these events happen, to make sure that we're getting the right information to the right people. Um, we want to um, you know, engage with you, our customers, our developers, our, um, our community. We want to hear about your real world implementations. We want to hear about your, the stories that you've got, the challenges and successes that you've had. Um, you know, tell us how long these sessions would last, what content you would like us to cover, um, who are the experts that you want to hear from, and we'll see if we can reach out and, and, and get them on. Um, and ask your questions. Um, please submit your questions in the chat to, the, to our speakers, um, and we'll be happy to cover those off at the end. I said this earlier on earlier shows, we will make sure to um, cover as many questions as we can. It might involve going over the hour, if you've got a hard stop then don't worry we'll make sure you get the recording um, and you can hear all of those questions the speakers today we've got paul mcgarth from iclr and he's going to be discussing case genie um, which is an ai driven search facility that analyzes legal texts uploaded by users and make recommendations um, built on uh, mark logic and a number of other technologies iclr um, I've, I've got a really interesting application here, um, and so it would be great to hear from Paul. Uh, also joining us will be Frank Blau from Epcon. Um, Frank will discuss the powerful narrative that can bridge the gap between theory and technical perspectives when discussing multi-model data challenges. Um, he's the, the quip, the messages, the medium can frame a strong use case for uh, the use of Mark Logic in a project, um, and so really putting Mark Logic into context in the real world. Um, so it'd be great to hear from Frank. Um, and then lastly, we've got Mitch Shepard uh, from our project management team. Um, Mitch is going to provide us with an overview of the Mark Logic Python client API and library. Um, this is this is a, a new uh, API that uh, we've just launched. Um, and he's going to take us through um, uh, all the key features and a short overview of that. I'm just going to introduce, again, if you missed us uh, last month, um, I'm going to introduce the community portal. Um, this is a way for new customers, for existing customers, um, to interact with Mark Logic. You will get the latest news, events, product updates, blogs, anything like that will all be shared um, through the community forum. It's also a forum for you guys to talk to us. So if you have questions about the product, uh, use cases you'd like to explore, uh, can't find information somewhere, um, then let us know. It's easy to access documentations, downloads, and other repositories, not just in the progress Mark logic world, but outside of it as well. Um, it's open to everyone. You can create a progress ID to contribute. Um, and then we're asking people to contribute in other ways, not just um, via events like this, but maybe it's a knowledge-based submission or it's a blog or it's a, a white paper you'd like to work with us on. Um, and we're just getting started with this. So yeah, you can sign up using the link below. Um, this is the, the, the front page. You'll find the top knowledge-based articles here, as you can see, a uh, community event. And then this, our new forum, um, where you can ask those questions um, and engage with us as well. To support the launch of this um, and ongoing is a, is a reward program um, to uh, get you guys engaged um, and give you some rewards for, for doing so. Um, this is a bit of a gamification. Um, maybe it's a bit of pride because you can earn some badges um, along the way. Um, you can make a like, ask a question, answer a question. All of these things um, will earn you points uh, towards getting your technical badges. Once you reach level five, um, there are gift sets that are available for you free of charge. Um, so uh, as you level up, 
uh, you get more and more. And in fact, they just announced the level nine, um, which is a very large plushie uh, of the of the robot there. Uh, I hope it's the one with the smiley face. So, um, and there's other ways of earning points as well. So, you know, attending some of these sessions, um, presenting at some of these sessions, um, you know, doing all the stuff that we, we've talked about earlier can, can help you earn points. Um, and as a thank you to everybody that's joined so far, not just today, but for every single one of our uh, community events, we'll be uploading points onto your account um, to reflect uh, uh, as a thank you um, for, for, for joining us. So, um, so yeah, hopefully... Go to, go to the community portal um, and hopefully you, you enjoy the interactions there. So without further ado, I will hand over to Paul McGrath, he's Head of Product Development and uh, Online Content at the ICLR. Um, Paul, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, how much time do I have? Do you remind me? Uh, oh, probably, probably about 15 minutes, something like that, 10, 15 That's fine. minutes. Yeah, just to set my clock down. Okay. Um, Thanks very much for the introduction. And um, I'm going to share my screen now for a little presentation um, to describe uh, what I do and our uh, um, Mark Logic uh, journey. Um, I can't see why my screen isn't coming up to share. Um, so I've got a problem with that at the moment. Um, anyway. So I'm going to go down to that. Okay. Perfect. There we go. We can see your screen now. Good. Right. So ICLR uh, online. This is our. So um, to begin with, um, ICLR, the Incorporated Council of Law Reporting for England and Wales, is a Sorry, very. Paul, old... you're... Sorry, Paul. Your, your screen's gone again. I don't know why. Oh. Okay. Um, Apologies. If you just share your screen like you did last time, it should work. Okay, I'm trying to. Um, what if I do it like. Um, Does that work? Yeah, perfect. There we okay, go. I'll stick with that version then because it seems if I try and do present a view, it disappears. So, um, ICLR is a, a traditional legal publisher. We were set up in 1865 um, to publish reports of the most important cases decided in the, in the senior courts. Um, so, what we've always done is we've printed the reports are on paper and, and people bind them into volumes and they are used to line lawyers' offices up and down the land and occasionally the lawyers have to live that. Um, and in the 1990s, we started to digitize all the content uh, through a third party. And we put it onto CD ROMs and that was considered the future. And that was very exciting because you could do all sorts of things like searching through all the content. Uh, using your computer keyboard. Um, in addition to publishing case reports of individual cases, we also published uh, in hardback books um, uh, lots of indexes, which were basically uh, information about the cases, about the subject matter, the titles, um, how they were related to legislation or other cases. And these are a bit like telephone directories in that uh, you know you can sort of look up somebody by name or you can look them up under a list of um, you know, what they do or businesses or things like that. Um, it was, you know, the way things were done, it was quite cumbersome. Um, when we wanted to put everything online, we then had the problem of trying to extract all this information from separate um, sort of vaults uh, about a case there would be information about its case name, information about the other cases that it had considered, uh, information about its subject matter, information about the legislation that it considered. And this was all stored in separate, basically separate chapters within the index. We had to pull all of this information together, 
each individual case onto a single, what we call an index card for that case. And all of those index cards, the only way that we could think of indexing them at that stage was to use a traditional SQL database. Um, so that was what we had. Um, and the problem really, when we went online, was in matching up the information for an individual case, such as you might see on the right-hand side of the page, and the information that was kept in the index, which you'll see on the left-hand side of the page there. So for each case, we have both the case report itself and then all this uh, ancillary information and its relationship to other cases, uh, which is very important in the law because, for example, an important um, uh, precedent might be set by the Court of Appeal, but then on appeal, it would go up to uh, uh, the Supreme Court or the House of Lords and, and they might reverse it. So whenever you look at a case, you need to know whether something has happened to it, whether a later case has come along and um, basically approved it or, or disapproved it. Um, so it was quite a complicated process, bringing everything into one place when people were trying to look at a case. Um, nevertheless, we managed to bring everything onto one platform um, and you were able to look for cases using one search form, to look for legislation using another, and we had these sort of um, uh, little cards for every new piece of content uh, in a sort of browse list on the home page. And we were very happy with that until, sorry, I'll, I'll jump ahead too far. Uh, until we came to a conference, I think in about 2016, there was a conference, a Mark Logic conference that we went to. And um, that was the moment when I had a sort of, um, uh, I saw the light. I, I was, it was explained that, you know, you could have all these different types of content, XML case reports, PDFs, Word documents, text documents, and SQL databases, all that. You could bring it all together and do a search across everything. And that was the benefit of our logic. So we basically built a completely new platform um, through our developers, 67 Bricks, and um, basically revolutionized the way that we presented the content online. So this was a journey really from, from a print publisher to, to doing stuff in CD-ROMs and then going online, and then eventually managing to bring all the data together um, into a single searchable format. Um, so basically each case has a sort of envelope of data and that includes all the index material. And so this is the home page. It shows you can select matters by topic. Um, you can look at the new content that's recently been added. Um, it doesn't look that new because it's quite an old photograph, but um, you can then search for the cases. But when you view a case, you can, you can, first of all, you can view the case report itself, and then you can flip to the index page, which now collects all the index information about the case, all the metadata, all the sort of satellite data that relates to that case. So we were very pleased with it at that point because we had all our content in one place. We had a way of searching all of it together and of marrying up uh, the case reports with the index material that allowed people to find the content. Um, but we then had um, a moment when we thought, well, okay, we, this is as, you know, as, as far as we've gone so far, but we've got all this data and, you know, there are cases that people can't find because using traditional search methods, you don't always get to the content uh, unless it's been categorized and indexed in a particular way. So if you look at this index page, you'll see that the subject matter has been classified according to a, a heading with European Union at the top and there's a sort of hierarchical heading structure there. Um, it's been classified under European Union and also under extradition. But if you were to try searching for it under crime or something else like that, you might have the difficulty 
that unless you use the right uh, search terms, you wouldn't necessarily find it. Um, so we decided to do, we set up a little research and development lab at ICLR, and we decided to investigate what we'd do with it. And we went down the line of investigating um, the possibilities of natural language processing. And through that, um, we came to develop um, what, what became Case Genie. And the purpose of that was basically when you're looking for a case, there are cases that you already know about. This is, you know, from a legal perspective, a lawyer's research. There are cases that you know about. There are cases that you know you can find out about because there will be information somewhere that you will lead to them, that will lead you to those cases. But there are also what you might call the unknown unknowns, which is the cases that you don't even know that you don't know about. And the big fear for a lot of uh, a lot of lawyers, a lot of barristers, is that they'll go into court and they'll be presented with something that the other side has found that they weren't aware of. So, so this is a, 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 a big danger. When you're doing research, you need to know about things that you don't know about. So basically, we um, built a system called Case Genie. Um, the solution is that you have very, usually you will have some kind of document in your possession. It will be your brief, your skeleton argument, your uh, the, the statement of a problem in, in, in the text form. And the idea is that <clears throat> you should be able to upload this to our system where it will be analyzed. Um, the cases you've already cited will be extracted and checked against the system to see if their status is still good. And then it will select, it will suggest to you other cases that share the same um, subject matter, the same concepts and ideas, which are similar in terms of if you can imagine the sort of the DNA of a legal problem, you know, is it a problem about crime or is it a family law problem? But delving a little bit deeper than that, what kind of problem is it? We can analyze the document and then we can suggest cases that are similar. So this is what happens. You can upload a piece of text or, sorry, I've jumped there. Analyze a piece of text. Um, you, uh, you can just paste it in or you could fetch a document and you put it through this pipeline of processes where the document is encrypted because we know lawyers are concerned about the security of their data. So we encrypt the document and then we convert it, we put it through these uh, various processes, we classify the parts of speech, identify the named entities. All of this is sort of standard um, natural language processing uh, kind of uh, process. And we identify the the vectors, essentially, we have 600 vectors um, which we use to uh, analyze and to compare the content that you've supplied with other cases. And then it suggests results. So it will give you up to 50 results. Um, and these are listed in front of you, and you, you can scroll down, you can filter them according to the legal topic or the court or other things like that in the same way as a traditional search. Um, it will also extract for you a list of anything that you've cited in your document. It will check that against the index and see whether those cases are still good law. And it will identify, uh, as in the lower half of the page, it will identify any legislation uh, which has been cited in the case. Um, when you look at the case report itself, oh, sorry, this, this is an example of where the legislation has been, uh, if it's been cited, the legislation cited there, the Channel Tunnel Act, uh, you can actually link directly to the legislation. We pull this content in from the National Archives who publish the official legislation for the UK at legislation.gov.uk. Um, and then when you look at the cases that are recommended, this is an example of, of the newer version of the index card, where we have extracted a lot of information about each case, some of it automatically. Um, so looking further down this index card. Sorry, sorry Paul, I just, yeah. are you on a different screen? Because we can't see you scrolling down. Um, 
I'm not. Oh. Well, I'm just going for a different. Um, I'm not scrolling down so much as going to a different slide, which is a ah, okay. cut of having. Okay. Scrolled, no problem at all. So I'm not scrolling down. Um, so further down. So you can see the table of contents on the left, and basically what I'm doing is I'm taking snapshots at different uh, stages of the same long page that contains all the index information. But the reason I wanted to show this is that it pulls out a list of all the cases that have been referred to in this content or later cases which have referred back to that. All of that is also done by natural language processing, by scanning the content and pulling out uh, cases and citations and matching them up against something that's in our index. Um, so these processes, sorry, I jumped ahead again, um, enable us to provide the user with a, a list of suggestions of cases that they should look at. And I just want to go back to the to the um, the results page because um, one of the issues that we have is that although we've pulled in a lot of we've we've got a lot of content where we've created. Um, uh, basically, a summaries and, and uh, analysis of the case. There are cases where we have literal more than just a copy of the judgment. And so, if you look at the second entry down in this list of results, the, the Unity Mark case, um, we've literally only got the name of the case and then a link to where we've got the judgment. And we haven't extracted any more information about that case. One of the things that we're now doing what we're now doing in order to enhance the value of case genie is to use uh, generative AI to create quick automated summaries of new pieces of content. Now this, obviously for 150 plus years, we've been employing uh, qualified lawyers to write up the cases, to write the head notes and the commentary on the cases and, and the index. Um, catch words that we use. So we don't want to replace all of those people for the cases that are important enough to report. But those cases are a selection out of a vast brand type of content that we don't have any intention of reporting. Uh, they're routine cases. They don't say anything new. They're not going to set a precedent. But people might still want to look at them in order to understand, you know, they might want to find some hidden gem, or it might be that it's a new case that hasn't been reported yet. And if they had some way of understanding more about what they might be looking at from the, the results page, um, we think that would make it more useful to them. So we wanted to write these brief summaries. At the moment, what we do is we extract sort of the first hundred words of the judgment, which is sometimes you know, quite a good indication of what the case is about. But sometimes the judge will go off on a tangent and quote from Shakespeare or, or something that might be entertaining, but doesn't actually tell you very much about the case. Um, so we've been looking at um, other suppliers, and one of the people who do this sort of thing is a Canadian company called Canley, uh, which is managed by Lexum. Um, and they have done some experiments with using ChatGPT, I think it is, um, and they've called it Catley. And they featured this little picture of a cat, uh, which was the one that was um, a lawyer mistakenly put in their um, online uh, case hearing in, instead of themselves. I think their daughter put it there and they couldn't get rid of it. But it's become quite famous as a meme as a result. So this is an example of an automatically generated summary. And it's not our site. It, it's a Canadian site. But it's something that we are looking into doing on our site. Um, so that would be a further use of AI um, to enhance the value of our product. Um, I think I've probably spoken for long enough now. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we're probably going to have some questions at the, the end, especially regarding the, the generative AI. And yes, I do remember the, uh, the, the, the infamous cat lawyer. Uh, yes. I think that appeared on the BBC <clears throat> News for for his ire, but uh, but so have Um I'm going to hand That's over cool. now um, to um, Ebcon. So, uh, have you removed my share screen? Yes. 
yeah, that, that, okay. that's all sorted now. Nice. Um, so, yeah, so I'll hand over to um, Epcon um, with Frank and Gregor. Uh, gentlemen, it's over to you. Wonderful. Um, so thanks, everyone. Thanks for the handover. Um, my name is Craig Sieber. I'm Executive Vice President um, at Epcont, and I've got with me uh, Frank Blau, who will be doing the majority of the talk today uh, and of the work. I think this is kind of the setup that we appear to be having in the company. Um, so my honor is to do a quick introduction of um, what we do at Epcont, and I think that will feed quite nicely into um, what Frank is going to talk about. Um, and um, I'll actually leave it up to you, Frank, then to introduce the details of your talk. Um, just a quick um, bit of background about AppCont. We are um, a longtime partner and integrator of MarkLogic um, and some of the tools that kind of like to sit on top of MarkLogic and also some of the tools that MarkLogic likes to sit on top of, like some of the major cloud providers. Um, our focus is really on delivering full-blown solutions to the customers, so we don't do just um, database work, um, we, we can really um, deliver on sort of from an idea um, down uh, to the operations. Um, our customers do go across the board, but um, I, I was um, quite interested uh, about the talk that we just heard. Um, so some of these challenges um, are, are quite well known to us. Um, we've been working with um, a lot of publishers uh, more on the German speaking markets and, and also in the US. But we do also have uh, quite a lot of um, corporate or enterprise customers um, that, that have these challenges of um, having data in different formats, unstructured and structured, and trying to make sense of it. Um, and Frank, if you could go to the next slide. And basically what we want to help them do is take that existing data and maybe augment it with some new data, external data, um, put it into MarkLogic, and, and then you know, help them build these data-driven business apps that we all need um, to, to get our work done. And um, yeah, I think this is kind of um, the lead in to what Frank is going to talk about, um, because this is very much about all of these different types of data that we have in the enterprise, um, how they work together and how the representation um, matters very much. Enjoyed. So thank you very much. This is not going to be your um, a typical kind of presentation that you would see here. And part of the reason is I'm a strange person, but um, I came to IT through the world of literature, actually, and I'm wanting to be a writer and just wanting to have better tools for that. But uh, along the way, um, I also studied media and a few other interesting things as well, guitars, as you can see in the background there. Um, but I came across um, Marshall McLuhan at one point in my career. Um, a lot of the early Apple people that we were talking about earlier were big fans of McLuhan also. And through the years, I've often gone back to um, McLuhan's work um, as my career in data architecture grew. And in the last couple of years, I came up with this idea that was based on something that McLuhan had said that most people know. Everyone has heard this quote, the medium is the message, um, and not really dug into what it means. And that's what I'm going to do here, but I'm going to do it through the lens of data architecture and how you can use this sort of story, again, my literature background, in your work with talking to customers about data. And that's kind of what I'm gonna do here. So when McLuhan said the medium is the message, it was a long time ago, it was 1964, I was one year old at that point. Um, he was mostly talking about television, radio, and print and how they sort of evolved into each other and what that meant for us. But more than that, what he was saying was that the content of a message is one story, but the structure of the data is also another story that oftentimes you don't miss. That is how you're getting this information. What, what, what is it, how is it being delivered to you? And it's pretty easy to see how you can talk about that in terms of the world we live in today with the internet, everything's all connected. It's almost like the medium is the message has become sort of like a de facto, almost a meme, I would say, um, about what we're doing. And but there's something else about McLuhan that I really like. And that is that he didn't want for this to just hang out there as something someone said one time and then you ignored it. He wanted us to continue to interrogate it. He wanted to say, OK, if the medium is the message, 
what is my medium here? What is my message here? And that's where I started breaking it down in terms of data architecture, which is the work that I do. And my background is in my uh, career background is almost all in business intelligence. I took some detours into robotics at some point, um, but it's about organizing data for insight, but not just any insight. We want to organize it around what we call actionable insight. And that is something you can act on. And that's really important when you're talking to customers. So I'm going to be talking about what I call data mediums. And we're going to kind of take a little brief, I don't want to say history here, but kind of where we, how, how we got there. Um, and that slide doesn't belong there. <laughs> okay. So what was the medium? He was talking about any technology that extends our senses and awareness. And what that means is if you have data and you're organizing it, what you want to extend is your understanding of it. You want to extend your ability to do something. Watching this last presentation, I was like, yep, there you go. The medium is the message. How ICLR organizes their data is their story. It isn't just the content. It's how it's organized becomes the story too. And so the first story I want to tell is what I call the relational story. And I grew up in the world of before, even before relational databases, really. Um, and my first part of my career was based upon knowing how relational databases work. But what is the relational story? Well, the relational story is I have groups of information that are connected to each other. I have customers. I have products. Um, I have purchases. I have locations. I have information that is primarily transactional. And the way I describe the store, the relational transactional story, is I say, I need to know what stuff looked like at a point in time, primarily, transactionally. I need to be able to change things very quickly. These are the stories that we told people when we were selling OLTP databases back in the 80s and 90s, is that this was really important to organize your data this way. And even today, we still use almost all of these principles in our work with databases. They're not, it's good database design doesn't go away. But eventually, as we started putting data into these relational transactional systems, we got too much data. And it was a bad thing for some people, but it was really good for me because we learned how to organize data in a different way. And when I say organize data in a different way, I mean, tell a different story a different medium, a different message. And what we came up with was a dimensional story. And the dimensional story says, okay, I have all this transactional information, but I need to know, you know, how much beer did I sell in the city of Dornburn on Tuesday nights to males in a given age range? And it's a lot probably. Um, but the relational database just couldn't do it. It couldn't keep track of this in a way that allowed my end user who had this very business question to ask, that is they had a business story to tell, they couldn't do it easily. And we came up with dimensional databases or data warehouses, data marts, whatever you wanna call them. They're still relational in nature, but they're relational and dimensional. That is, I create a fact about something and I attach the attributes in tables around it in what we call a star schema. And what this allows me to do is I can slice and dice my way through the data very quickly. I can say, how many blue shirts did I sell on Tuesday? And eh, show me that by Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday also. This is very easy to do in a dimensional model because the story of the dimensional model is just that. I'm taking facts and organizing their attributes around them, which is very different than a relational transactional model, which is around representing those transactional facts. And again, let's come back to McLuhan for a second. I've changed my medium from a relational transactional to a dimensional. And my story changed also, my ability to tell a different story. There's another kind of story. And this is what we call a time series story. And in a time series story, 
I'm interested in things happening very quickly. Many people here understand what IoT is, for example, Internet of Things, sensors. I have sensors all around. If I could turn my camera around, you'd see my little pollution sensor. I have a weather station. I have all sorts of weird sensors around. I have sensors in my refrigerator and my freezer. My girlfriend thinks I'm a little crazy. Um, and I graph it all. Uh, I store it in a database. But what time series data is about is really skinny data. That is, I have a sensor, a timestamp, and a value. The point of it, though, is I have lots of it. Data may be coming in at a millisecond level. I may be getting, in the case of, for example, say a heart sensor, like an EKG machine, a thousand points of data per second in order to draw that pretty little EKG graph. Um, I may be getting data in just at the second level for you know temperature or something like that, but it's very skinny data. And I need to reorganize my data in a way that allows me to tell this story. And that's what a time series data store is. It actually organizes the data physically on the disk in a way that you can ask these very time-based questions about it. That's another kind of story. And again, back to McLuhan, the medium the medium of time series is my message. When did something happen? What's the trend over time? And the ability to do that very fast is also the time series story. And this was great. We had, so now we have transactional, dimensional time series. But as we started writing applications to access this data, we ran into a problem. And the problem was, I needed to get all the facts about a customer, be they time series, dimensional, relational, in one place as a message, because I was using what were called REST APIs to transmit this information between my data source and my applications. And so we came up with this idea of a document, typically JSON or XML, and now you're starting to hear the Mark Logic story, um, but we did basically take all the facts associated with a particular customer or a particular event or in what we saw earlier, a particular case, and we put it into this document database. And in a document database, what you have is all the information, whether it be the canonical data, the historical data, everything, all in one document, which is very convenient for writing applications. If your application has to always be making relational queries, for example, it's sometimes gets very complicated. You get a lot of technical debt as you make changes to your, to your, to your database schema. It affects all your developers. It's a mess. So we, this idea of documents telling the story of all my facts in one place in order to communicate with an application becomes really important. And again, like McLuhan said, we have a different medium, a document database and a different message all the facts in one place, able to move them around between applications. That's really cool. But there's another story, the resource data framework. And what these are is, I don't know why I skipped, it doesn't seem to be going through my slides in the right order. Um, oh, I know why, because it went to, hold on a second, I'm gonna go back to where that slide is. It got knocked out of order here, sorry. Wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was you. I know it was. <laughs> um, and this is one that I love because this is the story of literature. This is the story of words. This is what we call a semantic story. So we have Frank Blau me, was born in California. You have a subject, a predicate, and an object. And what's really interesting is as this, as you start telling this story and storing the data in this way, Frank Blau was born in California. Frank Blau lives in Dornburn, Austria. TEDx 2022 takes place in Dornburn, Austria. If I organize my information this way, I can ask some really interesting queries that I wasn't able to ask previously. If I store data at scale, for example, in this way, I can say, show me all the people who grew up in California or were born in California and are somehow associated with the event, uh, just spilled, uh, are somehow associated with events that happened in Austria. And it's very easy to do these kinds of queries with millions, even billions of nodes stored this way. And again, this goes to a different kind of story. This is what we call a graph story. 
And a, a graph story is about the relationships, the relationships having value. If you tried to model this, which you could in a relational database, but you end up with very complex schemas. And what we want to do is be able to leverage my data as it is in this context. So what we have, and now I have to skip past a million slides to get back to where I was, <laughs> sorry, um, is this idea of sto storing data as a graph database where I have all these nodes. If you think of Facebook or LinkedIn, or you have your friends, your friends of friends, your friends of friends of friends who belong to a, a group of alumni for a college or something like that. Um, and you want to be able to query, hey, who's associated with that? Who is close to that? These kinds of queries can happen in milliseconds on massive data sets with graph technology. And so we want to be able to leverage these things. So we've told a couple of stories. But what is the what is really where, where do we go from here? And what I say is we live in a multi-model world. It is the rare client that actually has just one type of story to tell. They may have, I think I heard from IC, again, I'm going back to ICLR, it was a great t uh, a tie into this, is that they actually tried to put it all into a relational database and realized the limitations of that. And I'm sure we can come back to a good conversation about that um, because their data is multi-model. It has some aspects of relational, transactional. They may have a data warehouse somewhere. They have applications talking to each other through APIs, I'm sure. And they, they might even have some time series data. And this is the world that we live in today and is a multi-model world. So McLuhan's arguments have now kind of exploded. <laughs> it's like, okay, the medium is the message. Oh my gosh, I got 50,000 messages, right? I have all these different kinds of stories going on inside my organization. So you need a multi-model platform. And what you need is a, in essence, is what we call a multi-model database. And this is where Mark Logic comes in. Mark Logic is able to tell these stories natively. I don't need to, for example, create a separate relational model on my documents. Mark Logic does that for me. I don't need to create these uh, these RDF triples, these these little sentences about my data. Um, because Mark Logic does that for me automatically. Now you still have to have good data architecture. That doesn't go away. You still need a you still need a Frank. You know you still need someone that can basically walk you through how to how, how to set this all up. But once you set this up, you're able to leverage these stories, these different kinds of stories, documents, semantic, relational, into your entire data fabric and use them seamlessly across each other. I can tell you. Um, I have a customer now who has a very large Mark Logic database, and they think of it as a document data store. That's what they think of it as. And when we start showing them that you can treat it as a relational reporting source, also using Power BI, Tableau, Click, Python, whatever you want to do, transparently, without going through an ETL layer, that is, you don't have to transform the data in order to access it in that way. It's there natively in that way that you can query it. Um, that sometimes their eyes bug out. It's really, it's really fun to see people understanding. And then when you start showing that you can do semantic queries with tools like Sparkle and stuff like that, you can start asking the kinds of queries that graph databases excel at, again, natively in the fabric of Mark Logic. It's a really powerful story because that is the world that we live in. You may, for example, have some complicated query. I apologize for the size of this. This is there's a little tiny thing you probably can't even see. This is a little bit of code writing over here, trying to get some results from something, right? I think it's JavaScript code, right? But it, what it returns it to you as is this nice, clean document over here that you can process. And again, this is one context of my data. This is this is what I would call a story. My story is I have some JavaScript and I need to return to an application, something that can be consumed by an application, a document. And Mark Logic does that natively. And so in this multi-model world, we can play with this. We can also go into the world of semantic queries. And what you see on the left here is an example of a graph inside of Mark Logic where I say, um, department has hours of that they're open. 
um, employee has, um, what do we have here? His re a job review. Um, and these are sentences, but I didn't build this separately from Mark Logic. This is actually something that comes with Mark Logic as soon as you define your schema. It actually says, oh, you have a schema? Cool. Here's the triples associated with your schema. And I can run these Mark Logic graph queries natively. Whereas in a lot of other instances prior to sort of my, my life with Mark Logic, um, there was no life before Mark Logic, don't worry. Um, but but in that world, I had to create a separate database. I had to create a separate graph database to solve those problems. And with Mark Logic, you don't have to. You have the RDF triple store already there to ask these really cool kind of graph queries at scale. Very, very performant. But you also have in Mark Logic something that I spent a long time in my career doing, and that is data integration. So if you need to bring data into Mark Logic, your story is, hey, that's really cool, Frank, but I'm getting data in Excel spreadsheets. I'm getting data in CSV files. I have a data warehouse for my master data. I need to marry all this stuff together. Well, guess what? There's a native Mark Logic platform the data hub tool that allows you to not only load your data, but I can model it in the best possible way using whether I want a graph perspective, a relational perspective, I can model it so that it gives me that actionable insight that I talked about earlier. And then I can curate it. I can clean things up. I can publish things. I can have different versions of things. I can have highly temporal data. That is, I can have versions of things where I have the start time of something and the effective date of something. And I can track those over time. It, what we would do in a data warehouse with say a slowly changing dimension is built in native document technology um, in Mark Logic. And then I can also explore, which is really important to a developer like me. It's really cool that I can do all this stuff, but then I can go in and say, yeah, what are all my documents that look like this? What are all my documents that contain this? And what I'm doing there is I'm telling a story. And typically for me, the story is, did I get this right? Did I get my analysis right? Did I get my modeling right? And very quickly with these Mark Logic tools, I'm able to say, yep, I got it right. Or yeah, I got it wrong. I need to remodel some things a little bit. I go back, I rerun my model, and now it's correct. So this is the power of this multi-model database world. And I know that I, I also want to say, um, as I wrap up here, that I, 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 specifically left out time series because Mark Logic is not a time series database, but you can interact with time series databases very easily um, from Mark Logic because the configuration of your queries against your time series database are also in sort of very Mark Logic friendly architectures like JSON documents or XML documents that I can just pass to a time series database, get those results back and use them in this fabric. So my conclusion is to think about Marshall McLuhan. He's a super cool guy to read about. He's written some amazing books, um, uh, The Gutenberg Galaxy, um, uh, The Mechanical Bridegroom. These are all books. They're, they're a little bit dated, I would say. They're from the 60s and 70s typically. So they have like advertising stuff from the 70s as his examples. Um, but they're very powerful books to read if you can extend your lens as he would have wanted us to do to the world that we're in today, interconnected, AI, all that kind of good stuff. So that's my conclusion. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers, Frank. That was uh, that was really good as always. Um, uh, I've, I've seen a number of your uh, talks uh, recently and uh, uh, like I say, he's uh, always a good presenter. So, um, so thank yeah, you. thank you very much. Um, we'll come on to some questions and some comments at the end, but yeah, I like to say it's sort of data in context um and 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 you use story there so uh, so yeah that no, was really good um up next we have mitch shepherd from our product management team uh he's going to be talking about our python client api um we're giving us a quick overview and uh and uh, some instructions on that so mitch over to you fantastic um let's see tell me if you can see my screen yes we can Perfect. Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Mitch Shepard. I'm a product manager on the MarkLogic developer experience team. Uh, some of you may have seen me on previous uh, Bright Talks with the uh, MarkLogic community events talking about our new Spark connector or 
uh, ML Express, which is a visual uh, a VS code extension for MarkLogic. Today, I'm excited to be talking about our Python client API and about how we are now, you know, Mitch, building sorry, on. Um, sorry, Mitch, um, some people are having trouble um, seeing your screen. Um, I'm seeing your bright talk screen um, and not your presentation. Oh, gotcha. Would you mind then, James, just do, uh, would you share my presentation? I know I sent it to you and I'm having a little bit of connectivity issues today, but we might just yeah. run through that if that's okay, or Phil. No worries. Let me, let me pull that up now for you. Perfect. I'll have to do it within uh, two seconds. Sorry. Just want to make sure that, make sure you can see it properly. So I was waiting for PowerPoint to kick into here. There we go. Uh, and uh, here is the screen. There you go. Awesome. Hey, thanks for uh, that flexibility. So yeah, so uh, today we'll be talking about the Python client API. I'll just give you a quick overview of the connector uh, or the, the client API, uh, a highlight of its core functionality. And I think we'll, we'll kind of tackle any Q&A at the uh, end um, collectively. Um, so before we get into this, the, the Python request library, um, like previously, before this, uh, the client API came out, a user, a MarkLogic user was able to integrate with Python natively out of the box using uh, the Python request library. Um, it allows, it allow, this specific request library allows Python developers to easily create applications that would connect to MarkLogic's REST API. And then with the Python client API, um, it further simplifies the usage of that request library by supporting common authentication types and, and also improving the user experience with some of the more common endpoints um, when using that REST API. So, for those of you that aren't aware, we recently just published a um, a blog post on how using how to, how a user could use Python to interact with data with MarkLogic. Um, I'm not seeing a tab where I can easily post it in a chat, but I'll, I'll ask uh, Phil or James to at some point um, post that. Essentially, we walk through a lot of the a lot of the functionality for hey, you know, here's a way to using Python create a MarkLogic role. Uh, create a MarkLogic user, load your data, um, search your data, update the data, creating a view, say using a TDE, and querying for rows. And then after all of this is said and done, what is a, a Python user looking to do? A lot of times get it into a pandas data frame to then perform any of their analytics uh, with pandas or NumPy or you know their favorite Python library of choice. So all of that, and, and back up a slide if you don't mind still, um, all of that is, is really kind of a precursor to the uh, client API, what we're, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and Phil, I apologize, I'm seeing the, uh, the, two, the quote slide. Um, if you don't mind you jumping to the overview slide. It should be on the overview slide. It might be slightly delayed there for you. We got it, thank you. Um, so three of our core goals that we want to highlight is trying to create a greater experience for our customers that are using data science or machine learning and Python. Um, this is really going to make it a lot easier to, to kind of interact and um, do these things with MarkLogic. We want to make it easier um, for, for our users that are using Python to create their applications with MarkLogic. Uh, the client API makes it uh, easier to support a lot of the out of the box MarkLogic um, authentication types in those applications. Um, and then this blog post is one of those examples of how we can document common examples, uh, make it easier for a, for a developer or a user to know, uh, you know, what are some of the recipes? How can, I, uh, how can I easily get my data into MarkLogic using Python? How can I search it? How can I do these common tasks that, um, you know, were, were previously a little bit more difficult to find. So now they're all kind of documented in one place and we'll share that link. All right, pop over to the next slide. Um, so who are our core users? Um, all these kind of scenarios are, are focused around a Python app developer and a data engineer, right? An app developer is gonna, gonna be wanting to use Python and building their applications, putting these authentication strategies, a data engineer, 
is going to do want to batch insert or uh, batch write multiple documents with Mark Logic and Python. Um, before that, let's see, you can jump over to the next slide. Uh, before this client API came out, performing these batch read and writes was, was really difficult. These multi-part mixed requests, although possible with the HTTP um, requests and our Mark Logic REST API, uh, out of the box, it may have been a little bit more confusing and, uh, and difficult to, to prep up. Before, before this client API, um, a, a user would, ha would have to essentially perform HTTP requests using the Python request library. And, and additionally, um, you know, without this client API, if, if a user were, say, to use the new MarkLogic cloud that's, that's soon to be released, uh, they'd, have, they'd have to have some sort of knowledge of how to obtain and renew their tokens. All of these problems are, are kind of solved with the new client API in that we're, we're supporting a handful of those client authentication strategies with the Mar new MarkLogic Cloud coming out, Digest, SSL. Um, it's really building on top of that request library and, and making these things a lot more out of the box. Uh, additionally, we've addressed making it easier to read and write batches of documents um, with that client API as well. All right. Um, as what I think one one thing before I wrap up in this in this um, kind of client API functionality is this this is a V1 release, right? Like um, we we released just a handful of weeks ago, and are looking for feedback on what uh, what additional functionality or capabilities would help users be able to further interact with Python. Uh, we've received a handful of, of um, kind of feedback to to better manage eval requests or um, additional REST API capabilities. So if, you know, shout out to our to any of our users that are interested in using Python with MarkLogic, if there are specific functions or capabilities that you might be interested uh, in having supported by the client API, please reach out in the chat and uh, we'd, we'd love to chat with you some more and, uh, and get an idea of what your use cases are and see if we can't address some of those needs. So that this is very much high level overview of, uh, of our Python client API. It is available. Um, right now you can go and import it and uh, do a pip install of MarkLogic. Um, and we can send out a, a link to the GitHub repository as well for more uh, information and documentation. Yep, perfect, Mitch. Thank you very much. All resources um, will be shared after the event. So anything that we've mentioned today, any of the um, the, the content that, that that's been uh, shown, we'll make sure that you get a copy of and links to. So um, we're just going to um, quickly cover off um, some uh, future um, and uh, previous events, and then we'll go rapidly into the Q and A. So let me just share my screen now. Um, so recently, we just had and we've been mentioned on uh, on the uh, on the event already. Um, uh, generative AI uh, and uh, you know combining your data with that. Um, we had a really good event, really successful event, um, and uh, the um, the the link is there. I would recommend checking it out. Um, we had the feedback that we had from one person. Is it really shows. How Mark Logic's architecture supports uh, Gen AI and can improve the the trustworthiness and the accuracy of the results. Um, and I think it also speaks to Frank's point about capturing human subject matter expertise in your data and then scaling that uh, beyond where it is. Um, speaking of that, um, next meeting we have uh, an introduction to Semaphore. We've got a lot of new customers with us. Um, and we've also got our fellow Progress customers that are new to MarkLogic and Semaphore. Um, and so we're going to be introducing um, the Semaphore platform. There's going to be a demo. Um, and then we're also going to be joined by Nova Nordisk's um, Saritha Karusiko, um, who is their Senior Director of Data Representation. Um, she's going to be talking through um, FAIR data, um, its impact on um, a data, the challenges, and um, some of the lessons that are, are being learned about the implementations of that. So we're really looking forward to that on the 26th of October. Uh, then uh, on the 18th of October, so just a week before that, we've got our follow-up to the um, uh, AI event. 
um, which is leveraging AI in the enterprise. And it is looking at why semantic knowledge um, is so important for a trustworthy enterprise AI. Why bringing your data into context before you put it into the Gen AI is so important um, and also reflects what you're going to get back from the AI. Um, so please do join us there. Link, as always, uh, on the right-hand side. Um, so without that, uh, we've got some more events coming up. Like I said, we've mentioned Semaphore. We've got uh, a geospatial event um, with our partners, uh, Sensing Clues uh, and Clever Llamas in November. That's going to be really interesting. And then we're going to have a short holiday break uh, in December before joining us back in January. Uh, so, any questions? Let me just come out of here and stop sharing the screen. We've got some questions here. Um, does I'm going to jump into it because we're over the hour already. But like I say, I would say that if we if we've got any questions, we'll we'll stay on. Um, but does the new Python client support rotating key author, uh, authentication? Mitch, all of those words mean that something but not to me. So let's let's hand that one to you. That is a great question. Um, rotating key authentication. I'm wondering if you're referring to um, cloud authentication. I, you know, I apologize. I'd probably ask you a couple follow-ups. Um, right now, it is it is very much path through. So uh, if Mark Logic is able to support it, then we then the client API should be able to support that. Um, if it, if you are referring to something else, I would love to connect with you and, and better understand your use case. Perfect. Yeah. If you've answered, if you ask a question, um, we'll make sure to reach out to you anyway with any specific follow up uh, information to your question. Um, one one point that I wanted to mention, and I think we've kind of touched on it uh, a lot, which is this gen, the 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 the, the thing out that outside is Gen AI. Um, Paul, I, I, it was a great to see your story from inception through to Mark Logic to then looking then at Gen AI, and I think that's a really good story. Um, uh, to tell there, and what's your experience has been like with that at the moment? Um, you mean my experience with with customers or, or with, 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 with using Gen AI and and and, and Case Genie? I mean, when ChatGPT was was launched, um, you know, I played with it initially, and I thought, well, this is this is possibly a bit dodgy, you know, to rely on this. Uh, there's there's quite a strong element of garbage in, garbage out. I think you know, it's yeah. trained on data, which I don't think is you know, necessarily entirely trustworthy. Um, so I think what you need to do is you need to be fairly careful about how you're using gener generative AI and you need to check the results. And But in, in what we have noticed is in, in the sort of six to nine months uh, since then, probably a year now, um, the, you know, the typical, the people that we talk to who are lawyers and librarians, um, academics and so on, their attitude to, um, to generative AI is changing. And people are beginning to accept that it's a tool that you can use, providing you can master it, um, that you don't have to be at the mercy of its uh, vagaries, as it were. And so frequently, I mean, we've, we've had, um, uh, we've been to conferences where, you know, all the talks given at the conference are about some form of AI. Yeah. And all the exhibitors who are sharing the exhibitor hall with us are talking about their AI product. So we felt very smug, really, that we had actually, you know, we've got a product ourselves and we would say, yes, we have our AI baby too, you know, isn't it adorable? Yeah. Um, and we're working on other things. And, you know, people were, people are ready to talk about it in a serious way uh, and to use it as a tool and not, a, not to be mastered by it. What we've noticed is there were stories about the New York judge who castigated counsel because they produced some completely fake um, case yep. citations, which ChatGPT had come up with. Um, so, you know, it does hallucinate. There is that issue, that risk. But more recently, uh, an English quite senior judge, a Lord Justice of Appeal, has admitted in an interview that he used ChatGPT to write part of his judgment. And he said, you know, I checked it afterwards and, and it was just a very convenient way of, of me not having to sort of just type the whole thing out myself. I asked it a question and I checked its answer and it was correct. And I thought it expressed it in a very neat um, 
and condensed way that, that was very useful. So he made a use of it, but but he wouldn't have done that without checking it because you know his reputation yeah. would be on the line if he included it in a judgment. And I think we're starting to see that with with customers who are saying, well, you know, we we would be happy to use this if um, if we know we can trust it and if we know that it's kind of got checks and balances. It's um yeah, it's really interesting. The 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 event I was referencing to, the one we had last week, was demoing Mark Logic and using Semaphore, our semantic uh, AI knowledge management tool, um, to uh, to basically give you context. I searched the knowledge graph before you prompt so that you could get the, the, the correct information that you can provide additional context to the Gen AI. Ask your prompt. And then on the return, it checks that prompt or checks that uh, retrieval uh, for existing in the knowledge graph. So it helps the user then go, is this hallucinating? No, because it's a real case. I can see it in the knowledge graph. Mm. I can go to the location exactly where it is. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting way. So, yeah, if you, if you haven't seen that, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend checking it out because I think it's a, a really neat and tidy solution to the problem, but it has more value than... Uh, than uh, people realize uh, in that in that upfront thing. If, if I could do one of the things we see, sure. uh, we're seeing um, requests about is, um, okay, chat GPT is one thing, is chat GPT is going out and sort of looking at the internet, right? And it's a little bit outdated, you know, blah, blah, blah. You have to have some limitations around it. But what people want to do is use that technology of language models against their domain, yeah. not just the internet domain, which is, you know, whatever that is, you know, that's where you get the hallucinations yeah. from. <laughs> um, yeah. But but my domain, whether that be my internal corporate data, whether that be something else, you know, but and how you get from your data to a natural language query of it is not just chat GPT. You know, you have yeah. tools like Langchain and vectorization and stuff like that. They go into that, that you have to really understand, you know, I, I, I sympathize what you said about going to conferences and seeing everybody talk about AI because I'm like, half of it isn't even AI. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. But it's, it's something we're seeing too. People ask us about how do I take my corpus of data yeah. that I know about and convert that to something I can ask those kinds of questions of. Again, the medium, the message. I say again. Yeah, a hundred, a hundred percent. And yeah. you know, connecting your data, whether with you know wh wherever your data is. Um, to the AI, I think it's going to be the key uh, winning strategy for yeah. businesses. They will be they will be able to leverage their internal subject matter expertise at scale yeah. um, by by applying um, ontologies and taxonomies, fact extraction of the data, looking at the knowledge model for that you know the, the relevant information uh, in that query, and then getting that uh, into the AI. I think that's a more intelligent way of doing prompting mm -hmm. rather than just sort of relying on an AI that hasn't even seen your data. It's never seen the proprietary data in your business. Well, you also have a, you're also going to have a whole new body of data to look at. That is your generated data. And um, I'm actually not to self promote too much, but I am going to be speaking at the Frankfurt book fair about this, about CMSs and how they can really leverage what you're doing um, with this generative AI, because we're generating more data than we know what to do with. We're generating more content than we know what to do with. And so the idea of, you know, again, going back to metaphors about Gutenberg and, you know, things like that, uh, movable type, being able to organize your data in a way that becomes usable and not just, I have a lot of it is really important. And I think we're on, that's the revolution that's in front of us right now is generated data content management. Yeah. Um, uh, read the, the legal cases. Um, what NLP engine do you use to perform the entity recognition and tokenization, if that isn't a proprietary uh, thing for yourself? Well, I mean, we built this in-house, but I know that we used some uh, some products from elsewhere, but I can't... Uh, I think um, one of them was, was something called word to fec I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Um, Unfortunately, I come from a legal background rather than a technical background, so um, to some extent, I'm uh, I, I'm not really equipped with uh, completely. No, 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 no problem at all. One, one, 
one thing we'd definitely say to anyone out there looking at a similar thing is that I think you guys implemented Case Genie before we purchased Semaphore. Yeah. So if someone's got a similar discussion, please do reach out. These are many features that Semaphore can do. And obviously next month we'll be, we'll be looking at that. So please tune in for that. Yeah. Um, one one and, quick question I had, Paul, was um, what's your customer's response been to Case Genie? How, how have they adapted to it? What's their thoughts? Well, well that, that is interesting. I think um, what we found is that when we give demonstrations, uh, when we let people have a trial, um, they enjoy using it. Um, but we don't get the impression that a lot of people are using it kind of in earnest, as it were day to day for their research. I think they like to have it there. Um, it's um, one of the problems with, with something like this is, is that um, it's kind of a black box system. You put the data, you put your own data in, you, you get the results back. Um, and it, you can't really query it to say, well, why have you suggested this case? Why have you suggested that case? Um, this is one of the reasons why we want to pre be able to provide automated summaries or other ways of providing more information about the case so that at any rate when you've put in some some uh, a query or some data you can see something of a connection with what you've put in and what you've got out because i think at the moment um you get something like it'll well we set the maximum of 50 cases it will recommend up to 50 cases but very often Quite a lot of those might be um, apparently, you know, not relevant to what you're interested in. Uh, but it, it's very striking. What I mean, if you put in a query, it could be very striking what replies you get, what, what uh, suggestions. You know, you get one, three, and five will be completely on the point and very useful, and then two, four, and six will be apparently quite irrelevant or you kind of think, well, how did you get to that? It's a bit like lateral thinking or something. It, it, it's, it's kind of a bit weird. I think if, um, if there were some way of trying to explain what the connection might be, and I don't know whether generative AI can do that, but that is certainly that's the reason why we want to get these summaries there. We want to get other information, maybe to help the customer or help the user to see what the connection might be. That's certainly something we yeah. should talk more about as well as yeah. uh, one of the things in Semaphore is it's rules-based. So you mm -hmm. can actually, when you get a result set, you can go back and say these were the rules that fired and this is why we found those connections and what those those links are. But yeah. uh, I, I more, more on that not, next month. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we're not there yet, but the, where this world of rule-based stuff meets the world of analytics, it's going to get really interesting. Um, the analytics about my rules engines, for example, the and the sort of the DevOps side of AI um, is going to be really interesting. And I think that Mark Logic is uniquely positioned to be able to um, sort of surface that information in a way that makes it usable. So it'd be cool to see, see where this goes. It's yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing. The more you read on the topic, the the, the more you find that there's these fundamental questions that researchers at the lead, world's leading universities are trying to tackle yep. um you know especially when it comes to uncovering the, the the mind or the intelligence within the ai like why did you make that decision it's easy for us to explain things relatively as human beings because we have this context that we have in our heads all the time we only exist in a four-dimensional world you know mm -hmm. with time and that but the ai Chat GTP, for instance, has over 12,000 dimensions of, of data points that it takes. The, the, the warmness of the language used, the coldness, the, uh, the, the, the appropriateness, the, all of these dimensions it applies to the data to give it that score. Um, and so it's a completely foreign way of looking at the world. And so bridging that gap between man and machine becomes even more important. I think like I say, rules-based analytics, um, but rules-based interrogation of the, the the data and then the AI um, will play a key part uh, in the near future. So um, I think that is everything. Um, we've gone over a quarter of the hour, and I know I pretty much could speak to Frank and Paul all day long um, about this topic, but we'll, we will let them get back to things. Thank you very much for everyone uh, that's still with us. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining. 
um, and thank you to our speakers today. Um, it's been really interesting to, to, to hear both of your, your discussions. Um, thank you. And, uh, please do join us again uh, in the future. Okay. Thank Thanks, everyone. Much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Bye.